Okay, so in the next three lectures, um, I'm going to go over you, go over in a little bit of detail how you can build some simple online games uh, using sockets and threads. So we've given you the, the technology, the explanation, and whatever of sockets and threads. And now, because I'm a big-hearted fellow, I'm going to show you how you can actually use these to build online games. And I think this will be very helpful for your mini projects. It's your second mini project, that is. So the good news is um, you've got a ton of code, which I'm going to give you, that you can adapt to using your projects. The bad news is uh, you can't just hand it in as your projects. And the other bit of bad news is uh, tic-tac-toe's not one of the allowed games that you can submit. So um, you're welcome to adapt this to a different kind of game. But you can't just you know, say, oh, here's my wonderful tic-tac-toe game. It just happens to look a little bit similar to the game that you gave us uh, already. So you can get the code for these games. You're more than welcome to adapt and use it in your projects. I'm giving the, these lectures and that, this code to help you with your projects, but I'm not doing your projects for you. So, three, so we're going to have a very, very, very simple tic-tac-toe. Then we're going to go a little bit more complicated, going to use the multi-threaded TCP server I talked about in the previous lecture, and show you how to adapt that in order to produce a game that can handle multi that can run multiple games, multiple users. So this is a much more realistic um, online game. And then we've got a racing game showing how, which, and I'll show you how do you, you can use a combination of TCP and UDP to have like a game with real-time interactions in it. Very simple game. This lecture though is all about the very simple. Well, first thing I'm going to tell you what, how to play tic-tac-toe in case you don't know. I assume you do, but just in case. Then we're going to go through a very simple way of building an online tic-tac-toe with just a single player, single server. Couldn't get any more basic. They made it as basic as I possibly can. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can test, debug, and do the documentation for your projects, which is essential for any you know, stuff in computer science. OK, tic-tac-toe. Now imagine you play tic-tac-toe as a kid. Perhaps you're, you know, lined up for the annual tic-tac-toe championships as we speak. Uh, it's pretty basic. You've got a three by three board. Um, looks like that. Uh, one player is naught. Uh, the other player is cross. That's like the mark, their mark. And the players take turns out a naught or across to the board. And the first player with a line of noughts or crosses wins. So here we have the board. Um, and so the first player, let's suppose they're across. And so they choose to put their cross there. Second player, well, they've got a plan, so they put their naught in the middle. The second player decides to go there, and the other player is not paying attention. Maybe they're chewing the pencil, looking out the window, whatever. So they decide, oh yeah, maybe I'll go, maybe I'll head for there. You know, let's, so let's put one up there. And the the first player, you know, comes in with a definitive cross. They make their mark, and they win their game. So the the second player should have the naught player should have paid more attention, really. So it's an extremely exciting game. Um, you know, fun for all the family and all that. And I think there's some way of winning. If you go, you can either win or draw if you go first. And I can't remember. I think it's maybe a corner. And maybe if you go there in your second move, something like that. I can't remember the details. Anyway, that's tic-tac-toe. So now I'll show you how you can build an online game that enables two people on two separate computers to play online tic-tac-toe. The point of this is that I'm giving you a framework that you can then adapt um, in order to play different board games. So if you're struggling with your mini projects, you really don't know where to start, then this is the place to start. You say, well, look, let's try and understand this simple tic-tac-toe code, and then let's think of a board game that we can adapt it for, you know, snakes and ladders, Scrabble, you know, whatever. We can, you can use exactly the same approach with a more complex game. The main thing you have to change is the board class, which I'm going to talk about in a second. So I'll give you a demo of this. So get things started. Um, so in this case, I'm going to run everything, run this stuff from the, from the command line because it's easier to see how changes from, so on one player are reflected in the, what the other player sees. And I'll explain how you do this in a second. So, so we've got player one, and we're just going to run start player one. Uh, I think that's right. Maybe that starts player one, yep. So that's player one started. And then we start player two. Maybe that's it. Yep. So here we're playing the game. So player one's the server. So it's waiting for player two to connect. Uh, player two is connected, connecting to player one. 
and then turns out the player one is the cross, so it displays the board. This is my rudimentary way in which I display the board, and I enter numbers by typing, typing two, enter my, the next mark by entering two numbers corresponds to the board position. So this is board position 0, 1, 2 on the x-axis, and 0, 1, 2. So let's say I want to enter 0, 0. So I just type 0, space 0, press return. So that enters a cross at this position of the board, and then the board's sent to player 2. And so they see what player 1 has entered, and decides to make they mark. So maybe, let's suppose they go 1, space 0. Uh, has that worked? No, because I'm in the wrong console. So now space one, space naught. It's got lousy error correction. Right, here we go. So now the naught player has entered their mark here, one naught. Now it's the crosses player. So let's suppose they go um, naught one, naught one. So there you go, they're edging down. It's getting exciting now. So the, there's two, two in a line, the crosses. So the naught player better act soon or they can lose the game. But unfortunately, the naught player, yet again, is uh, not very talented at this, so they're going to type naught 2 naught. So they're sort of doing something a bit random. They've added, added an extra naught there. And now it's the crosses player turn. So then they decide, well, aha, I can win this. Let's go for it, folks. So they type naught 2, um, and the game's over. Dear me, this player's lost. This player's won because they've got three, three crosses in a row. So this is the, this is the game. And this is how it's played. OK. So let's go back to the, back to the slides. And I'll explain how to, build this, uh, how to build this. So we've got an interface called constants. I use that in pretty much all the uh, examples. Um, and then we've got three classes. It's dead simple. We've got a board class, a player cl and two player classes. So the constants interface is just a, it's a very easy way. This is a very easy way of defining, a, of sharing uh, fixed variables um, with multiple classes in a program. So these are all final variables that have certain fixed values that don't change at all throughout the entire program. So you could possibly have done this with statics, but this is just easier because you implement the interface and then you have instant access to all these variables. You can just use them in the code. So we've got like the IP address uh, port, and then instead of, how, instead of using the chars, um, which are fraught with problems. I have like defined naught and defined cross and a blank. for These are the marks that we have on the board. And then if to use that interface, I just say player one implements constant. So it's much easier than if I want to use the, the actual variables. I can just do so straight away. So then we have, um, then we've got the board class. Now, in your mini projects, this board class, if you're doing a board game, will be the core of what you do in your projects because it's, it's got all the functionality for playing the game. And then all you have to do is you know, decide how you're going to share or update this board between the different players. So in my case, I've got a board that represents the tic-tac-toe board. And I've got methods that add crosses, etc. And what I've decided to do on this simple implementation is make the board serializable so that I can send that board um, between players. So player one sees the, the board, the class, makes changes to that class, that object, sends it off to player two. Player two changes the, the object, sends it back to player one, and so on and so forth. So the board itself is passed between the players, and the players make their changes to that board. So it's just like having a bit of paper in real life. In the more advanced version, I'm going to talk about um, in the next lecture, the, you know, then the, actually going to be three copies of the board. I'm going to use messages to update the state of the board. But in this simple example, we're just going to pass the board around. So this is our board class. It's implementing constants, um, so we can use all the variables and constants. And it implements serializable so that we can pass it so you can send it across a, a socket, send it between computers using sockets. And the board itself is represented by just a simple two-dimensional char array, and then we've got various booleans to represent whether the game's over, who's won, this kind of stuff. And then, yeah, serializable, and then a bunch of methods to actually play the game, so we can add a cross to the board, add a naught to the board with various bits of error checking, like board full, game over, get mark, get player one mark, get winner, is draw, is winner, all this kind of stuff. How, you're going to have to have a little look at this if you want to understand it properly. But they're just methods for playing the game of tic-tac-toe. And we include a print method. So you saw the delightful graphics that I produced there. Very sophisticated. So that's what's being output by the print method. And then we've got a couple of, these are all the public methods that any, any class can access. And then a couple of utility methods for checking three matching tokens, you know, like vertical, horizontal lines. 
an update game status um, to check whether the game's been won. So the, so the players enter the Norse Cross, and then, then uh, the board will check to see if one of the players has won or not. So that's the board. That's the, the core functionality, and that's what you have. Once you've got your board sorted, the rest of, the, rest of your project will be easy. Easy-ish. Now we've got player one and player two. So there's no sophistication here. We have one player, um, which is player one is the server, just like the very simple socket examples I gave you. The player one uh, sort of listens for connection. Then it randomly decides whether it's a naught or a cross. I think it's not random enough, frankly. Um, and it starts the game if it's a cross. And then player two, just a client, connects to the server, and it waits to receive the board from player one. And it'll, this board will either have a mark if player one's across, or no mark if it's a naught. So here's player one. Again, it's implementing constants here. It's got a board, reference to the board, socket input stream, socket output stream, and a scanner to read the user input. And a bunch of methods um, to check the board, make a move, send the board and receive the board and print the result. Playing the games where the, the main action happens. So we create, create a new board, create a, a scanner to read user input, and it says waiting for player two to connect. Does all the sockety stuff and a blocking call uh, for, the, for the waiting for the second player. Once player two is connected, we obtain the object input stream, object output stream. And then we've actually got to, then we've got to start the gameplay. So this is like the randomly selected, selecting whether it's a naught or a cross. And decides whether it's a naught or a cross. If it's a cross, uh, it makes the, move, makes the first move. So make move, um, other, and then once it's made a move, it send, like, puts a cross or a naught on the board. It uh, sends the board to the other player. And then this is the sort of loop um, within player one. So once, it, once it's sent the board off, it then sits in this method, waiting until the game's over. It's receiving a board from the other player, um, makes a move on the board, and sends the board back to the other player. And this is the sort of output you get, as I said, with the gameplay that I showed you. So say so NetBeans, you can do the usual stuff of uh, running, you know, running player one and then running player two. Um, but it's much easier, as I showed you, to run it from the command line, because then you can see the changes to the two players um, as they happen. So in this case, you change to the, you've got your project. Your project will have a build directory. The build directory will have a classes directory. So you change to project directory, build directory, classes directory. And if you type list or whatever, you'll see the packages um, that have been compiled. And one of these, if you're using my code, will be simple tic-tac-toe. And so you type Java, the package name, dot the, um, the class name. That's how you run the, run the classes within uh, the command line. So I'll just show you. I won't bother with the game again because it was, it was a bit too exciting. But I'll show you how the, so here, just show you how to run it from the command line. So here we have, uh, I don't know if you can see this. It's a bit of a small window. But I thought you can't see it very well. Yep, okay, so here we go. So, so this for me is D, OneDrive, bloody blah, 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 game architecture, build classes. That's the directory, and we're in the right directory. And if we, before we do that, actually, let's type, I'll show you the, the packages. So we've got these, all these different packages. So we've got a racing game, and we've got, so here we've got simple tic-tac-toe. So to start player one, we type Java, simple tic-tac-toe dot player one. And then that launches, launches that and waits for player two. And we do the same one with player two in the other command line. And then we can play it from the command line rather than playing it within NetBeans. NetBeans is the same idea, right? We just um, right click. If it's not running, if it's running, we get a socket error. Right click on player one. And then run file, right click on player two. But then you've got to mess around switching between them. But it runs in exactly the same way. Yeah, so that's all right. Okay, so that's the minimal online game um, as a w which you can use to get started on your mini projects. Now I'm going to talk about a few sort of, um, sort of, uh, going to give you some useful stuff on how to, error, how to debug your projects, handle errors that, and handle errors in them. So you must, 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 must have a systematic approach to error handling. You know, if you're, even with a simple tic-tac-toe game, 
things are going to go wrong, you know, you, and you won't necessarily what's going, know what's going wrong. You know, in, in the example if, that I gave you, if I type in the numbers wrong, if I type in a letter, maybe I check that, maybe I don't. There's, there's pretty rubbish error handling in it. But you really need a much more systematic approach to error handling. And the way I like to handle errors are exceptions. It makes much more sense to throw an exception than to try and do something very specific within your code that tries to handle the error. Most, most times, you want to throw an exception, and then that leaves it to a higher level class, the class that invoked the method, to deal with the actual problem. So if you, something goes wrong in your code, you don't know how to handle it, throw an exception. Then the exception is propagated upwards, most likely until it reaches the run loop, in which case you're going to have a try-catch block, and you can say something horrible went wrong, and then you can print the stack of the classes that threw the exception. So here we have a little bit of an example of that. So we have a, a method here, do something. It's got a try-catch block, and it's calling this method do something tricky. Do something tricky declares that it throws an exception, and it's calling something do something really tricky, and do something really tricky is also throwing an exception, and all it does is throw an exception. So we can call do something tricky because we've got this in a try-catch block, and, and, and do something tricky is the sort of thing that throws an exception, so in order to use this method at all, in a method that doesn't throw an exception, we have to have a try-catch block around it. And so we're calling do something tricky, um, that's calling something doing really tricky, and that declares that it's throwing an exception, so it's not a problem that's calling another method that's called throwing an exception. And then that's, um, that itself is throwing the exceptions. So, so this is throwing the exception, and that calls this is to throw the exception, this throws an exception, and then that's caught in this catch block here. So we might be like way down the code, doing something very specific like reading input, and so it makes much much easier to just throw the exception here, and then higher up in the code, we can then try and analyze what went wrong and do something about it. So input validation, I did sloppily in the example code, so don't, don't learn from the input validation in the example code. You need to check the input of play extremely carefully. It's less of a problem with graph with uh, if you've got a JavaFX input interface, but uh, you know I've got like you know is is the ball, is the x position in range, you know this kind of stuff. But you need something much more sophisticated. So input validation is a really important place to look at um, for your error handling. Now I'm just going to say a little bit about how you could test your code, debug it, and write the documentation. So as you know, these are. Uh, Groups that have a, with of people who have different abilities, some of whom will be good at programming, some not. So, if you're less keen on programming, one way in which you can contribute to the project is through the testing and, and uh, documentation, because you need to test the project in lots of different ways. And with a code running across multiple computers, it's much much easier to do the testing if you've got two people or three people to do it. You need to say, you know, what happens if the player enters wrong information, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's going to be much much easier to do the testing. Uh, if you work as a team. <clears throat> now, testing and debugging kind of go together. So, you know, when I started doing Java programming, most often I just used system.outprintline to output information and track the progress of the program. Works okay, you can, but uh, after a while, it, it takes quite a lot of typing. Um, and, you know, if, it, it's tricky. You put lots of debugging information in, and then if you put too much in, you just get overloaded with information. It's often quicker and easier to use a debugger. So NetBeans has a very nice debugger built into it, and it can be very useful for figuring out what's going on. You can do all this kind of amazing stuff. You can step through the code. You can see the status of the variables. You can see where the program's crashing, all kinds of stuff. It's only really good for one, debugging one thread at a time, so if you're doing a complex multi-threaded application, you might end up using system.outprintline more than you use a debugger. Or you can debug a single thread, but because the interdependencies of the threads can be a bit tricky. So to use a debugger, you use this um, button here. Instead of running it with play, you run it with this like debugging sign, and you put breakpoints in the code, and the code will, and the, the, as the program runs, it'll stop on these breakpoints, and then you can choose to execute like go line by line, you can like step into methods, you can step out of methods and view the variable and so on. It's an incredibly powerful way of seeing what's going on in your program and fixing it. So I'll just show you how to use a debugger very quickly. It's not a comprehensive, so where have we got? We've got a debug demo, I think I include that with the don't know if I include that with your code. It might have been a bit a bit extreme. Okay, so what this is, we've got a couple of variables like a string a name and a number and then we got like a 
it's modifying these variables like changing the name, adding a couple of things to the name, and then we've got a number, and then we've got the calling this method increase number, and this method increase number is just adding, adding, adding some numbers to the number. So these are the variables in our program which we can, which we can monitor, and these are the, this is the code that's modifying these variables. So what I'm going to do first is I add a breakpoint. So click on the code like that. What I've added is a breakpoint, which means that when I run this under debugging mode, um, it's going to have a breakpoint. Now, in this case, I can't click, I can't click this handy debug button um, because it, there's lots of main methods in this, in this code. What I can do is I right click on, right -click on the code and select debug file. So this is very nice. So what you can see is it stopped here, it stopped at the, the breakpoint that I specified. And here we can see the, the variables. Uh, so down here, we have the, the name variable, which is currently null, because we haven't initialized it yet, and the number variable, which is currently naught. Now at the top here, we have various things. We have our, well, not previous occurrence. Where are we going here? Find the all of oh yeah there we go sorry it's all everything's a bit compressed right so we've got step over these are the sort of crucial debugging bits so we've got step over step into step out so step over just steps over the line of code so we step over that line of code and it, you can see that name has now been initialized uh, to empty string next line of code puts David into that string, so we'll step over that, and now you can see that the string's changed to David. Step over the next line of code, uh, to the next line of code, and it'll initialize number to three. You can see that there, and, and created David Gamers as the string. And what I'll do here is I'll step into, step into this function instead of stepping over it, and that pulls me into this function I've just called, this method I've just called, uh, increasing the number, and then I can like step over these and you have to, you know, you can see the variables changing again. So now it's become 10. And what I can do is uh, yeah, step over it again, or I can actually step out of that function, that method. And you can see that it's now run through these, and we step back out of that method, and now we're up there again. So you can see that we can see exactly what's going on with our variables, and we can step through the code and watching it as it runs, in a sort of in, and we can control its execution. Um, so it's extremely useful uh, for doing lots of. Um, debugging stuff for understanding what's going on and what's, what's changing the variables because I could have wasted a lot of time writing system.out print line number after each of these um, each of these calls or system.out print line name but in this case I can just see it there all I have to do is press a different button to run it and, the, and all the information's there all right so we'll stop that okay so in your project report, supposing this was your project, I'd say it's not going to be a project, but supposing it was, in your game you have to explain how it's played. Um, in this case, not like the rules of tic-tac-toe, that'd be a bit much. But how do you start the game? How does the user enter positions? You know, the typing of the, the numbers separated by the space. Talk a little bit about the classes. You have maybe have a table for that with a brief summary of what they do. And maybe screenshot or command line output of the clients and server. Not screenshots or of, of uh, you know, of NetBeans, any of that. Just in this case, there's no graphical interface, so the screenshots would be of the, you know, the little board output, that kind of stuff. The sort of screenshots you should give are, this would be a sensible screenshot to give, not, you know, a screenshot of NetBeans with code in it. So please, no, no screenshots of code in your, in your project report. I've given you all the example code for this uh, little example um, on the course website. And there's an online version of Tic Tic Toe with graphics described in this book. Um, OK, so it's just a quick demo I've knocked up to give you some ideas about how to, how to do your mini pro second mini projects. It's, it's full of limitations. It's quite rubbish, really. Um, different ways of implementing it. As I said, um, in this case, I passed the board around because that seemed conceptually the easiest thing to do than sending a message class and using the message class to update the board. In the next example I'll give you, there'll be 
three copies of the message class, three copies of the board, and message should be used to update the board. Um, there's no obligation whatsoever to use this code in your project. It's purely an example to get you started on your projects. If you've got better ideas, different things you want to do, that's absolutely fine. I provided this code for you to adapt and use, but I haven't done your project, right? Don't hand this code in um, at the beginning of the summer term and say, here's my project, because there's zero marks for a tic-tac-toe game. So you'd be wasting your time there. If you use this code, I'm expecting to see signs you've adapted it for your own game, okay? It's, it's not your project, it's a starting point for your project. So, this lecture I've explained how you can create a simple online board game using sockets. No threads in this case, but that's, you know, and it's, it's, it's rubbish functionality is derived from the fact that it's so rigid. I'd never use this in practice, I'd use something a bit more like the next example, in which I'll explain how you can use threads to create a much more flexible online tic-tac-toe game. <laughs>